Hello, my friend. Before we start this amazing episode, I want to invite you to the personal Patreon page of this podcast. If you love what's being done here and want to keep the podcast and the meditations free to the public, then you can come on over to our brand new community on Patreon and donate $11.11 a month and all proceeds will go towards keeping this free, keeping this going. Plus, we'll be building a community together and I'll give you bonus material. You can explore this option in the description of this podcast or just go to patreon.com slash Dr. Reese. Let's begin. Welcome to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese, a program that can help you become liberated in the modern world. Now, here's your host, Dr. Kevin W. Reese. So, can you find peace as an entrepreneur? Welcome to episode number 109. Today, I'm talking to Phil Strazula. He's an entrepreneur and founder of Select Software Reviews, a website dedicated to helping HR and recruiting teams to find and buy the right software. In this discussion, we'll talk about what he does to find peace as a businessman, busy, grinding, on the go, and all the methods and mindsets that are needed to keep your peace. So sit down, relax, and take in this beautiful and valuable recording. Let's begin. Phil, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. When you're an entrepreneur and you're in that grind, and you're just you're just chipping away every day and you have goals and a mission. How do you keep that peace and that stress nice and aligned? For me personally, I get a tremendous amount of balance from meditation. Mm. So I meditate four to six times per week for probably 10 to 20 minutes each time. And it's really not that big of a commitment especially if I look at my TV habit or something like that, but it, it actually has really impactful benefits that compound over time, I find. Mm-hmm. And so that, that's huge for me personally. I also get a lot of benefits from exercise. And I w- would imagine that's because we're all sort of like programmed at a genetic level to move. And if you're not moving, there's something wrong. Uh, and, and so our, our bodies want us to do that stuff. And that's why we get endorphins and just like a really great mental benefits, honestly, from doing mm. stuff like a hit workout or yoga or, or whatever you're into. Any particular type of meditation? Are you watching your thoughts? I just do the Headspace app. Okay. I've found that it's really accessible for me. I've had friends that have, you know, graduated from that and, and done different things. I've had one person who's changed their name and, and lives in a commune now in, in a, a different country. Okay. Um, and so there's, I think there's like many different, you know, variations of, of that habit that suit different people. And, and for me, it's just so easy to pull up that app. And sometimes I'll do like, they have these packs on, you know, dealing with anxiety or getting into performance mindset or whatever, or, or just like something as simple as a, a guided meditation. Were you surprised when your friends up, moved, became a sannyasin, changed his name, the, the whole the whole kit and caboodle? I was, I was surprised, yeah. Um, the first time that I kind of realized that might happen, so he, he was also an entrepreneur, had a very successful business that yeah. had raised um, venture capital money from an extremely powerful venture capital firm. And he just told me, he was like, I told them like, I don't, I don't care about any of this stuff anymore. Um, I'm just going to like go live in India now Mm -hmm. and like meditate for six hours a day and like work in this commune. And, uh, (laughs) you know, it was hard for his board members to understand that. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but they didn't really have much of a choice, I guess. But it, it it was interesting for me. It was it was almost like scary because he kind of put a lot of his life into getting to that point, yeah. And he was going to give it all up. And 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 there's two interpretations of that. One is you're making a huge mistake, and you're going to regret it in three years uh, when you come back to the Western world, and you could add fifty million bucks in your pocket. The the other is wow, that's really powerful that you're giving up that to, to do this other thing, which therefore must be better. Um, and it's, I think it's, it's still not exactly clear what the right answer to that is, but it, it's looking like more the latter, at least for him. This happens. People get a taste of that freedom. You still work. It's just a different kind of work. You know, if you're at an ashram or a monastery, you're still putting in work. It's just simple. It's gardening. Yeah. It's cooking. It's cleaning toilets. <laughs> when I went to an ashram, I met my first mentor. He was cleaning toilets. He was changing the sheets on the bed. That was the life that he chose. You know, so it sounds like your friend just reached a point of, ah, oh, this business stuff doesn't matter. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. And he seems to be extremely happy and mm. doing, yeah, you're right, manual labor, sort of getting into that flow state with something extremely simple that, yeah. you know, gets to those primal um, sort mm. of things that are programmed into us. Yeah, our village mentality, our tribal mentality, yeah. Instead of being in an office and having a table and a microphone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The person who goes deep enough down that path, it probably is the right thing for them. And, and the person yeah. who doesn't, just like somebody becomes an artist versus an investment banker, like you kind of, you know, at, at a subconscious level, like you're, you're, you gravitate towards the stuff that's like right for you for the most part. And sometimes yeah. our judgment is clouded by, you know, fear or greed or whatever. But a lot of times you kind of find your right path. I think it just takes a long time. So being an entrepreneur, I, I mean, I mean, you have to be really goal oriented, don't you? I mean, you, you, you could just kind of consider it as a game, right? You're playing a game and your reward is, is, you know, your bank account. You can still be spiritual and relaxed and, and be an entrepreneur. We see a lot of entrepreneurs just burn out. An example, I'm just going to use a celebrity as an example, but Sean Combs, did he? This dude's always stressing out on Instagram. Oh, really? Always on a rant. He's, he's you know, one of the richest people, you know, billionaire I don't know. It's impacting him in a certain way. I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, but you do see entrepreneurs sometimes, you know, they get to that, that burnout. Do you ever worry about that burnout? Yeah, I worry about it a lot. And that's why I very proactively, you know, turn off my work stuff on the weekends and take vacations and, you know, exercise and meditate and all this stuff. But I also think that, yeah, that there's lots of different reasons why people become entrepreneurs, but I think, and I fortunately gave up my Instagram a, a little while ago, but I, I would imagine like seeing, you know, somebody like that on Instagram with a little bit of manic energy, like that's probably like what made them successful in the first place. Like, if you think about like, what's the purpose of that energy from like an evolutionary perspective? And it's, it's to empower you to like do stuff. It's to motivate you. And yeah. he's somebody who's like done a absurd amount of stuff. And my guess is a lot of it's from that energy. And, and I don't know if somebody like that probably does have times of burnout, um, but they almost have like a never ending, you know, battery inside as well. Yeah. It's obsessiveness, you know. Yeah, I always like to point to Michael Jordan. That obsessiveness, we saw that in the documentary that came out last year. I mean, he's a, he was a savage. 
they're straight up savage. Uh, Kobe Bryant was the same way. And uh, his life was cut short in an incredible tragedy. I'm a go-getter too. So I, 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 I get it. Um, I've slowed down over the last few years, but you know, I spent my twenties just grind, grind. And, uh, you know, you never know when it's going to end. And, and for someone like Kobe, it, it's just so abrupt. Just what do you take from that tragedy? I think, unfortunately, it's like something that that happens, right? Like statistically, you're you're going to have stuff like this that happens on a daily basis. And once in a while, it's going to happen to a Kobe Bryant. And you're going to hear about it. Yeah. My guess is that somebody like Kobe, like, loved their life and lived a, a really interesting life. I think he grew up in Italy and, you know, kind of, he had his ups, he had his downs, probably really high ups, really low downs. Um, if you talk about like that personality type that becomes the top 1% of the top 1% of the top 1% at something mm -hmm. very, 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 very driven. And, and the reason that they are is because they're, they're sort of craving that achievement and craving that challenge. And he got to do that and on a world stage and he'll be remembered by a lot of people today forever. I mean, there, there was nobody in the world that was like, well, I'm sure there were, but there was very few people that were like, who's Kobe Bryant um, when, when he passed and he's mega, honest, mega famous, mega famous. Yeah. I'm like, I might be able to name three or four people that play in the NBA right now. Um, but like, I know who Kobe Bryant is, you know? And, uh, and so that, that's pretty cool. And I think that that's a really awesome legacy and it's a, it's so unfortunate that his life got cut short, but I don't think you can be like worried that that's going to happen to your life because it's, it's so unlikely, you know, if you're flying a helicopter to begin with. And so, um, the lesson is probably just like a, a little bit of more of, you know, enjoy the journey, enjoy your time. Hmm. When you're in your twenties, there's a 50 basis point chance you're going to die that year. When you're in your thirties, it's a 1% when you're forties, a 2%, like, that's just like stuff that unfortunately like you might have to deal with. And so it's better not to put off the things that are easy to put off. Um, yeah. and to, yeah, allocate your time. Don't live for retirement. Um, live for the, the here and now as, as much as you can, obviously we all yeah. do stuff we don't want to do, but. How do you keep your life work balance? What's your secret? Uh, and can you improve on it? I think I have found a good balance because I have cut out a lot of dead weight. So I, I don't do much procrastination. I don't do much like, you know, should I do this? Should I do that? I just kind of like do stuff. And so if you cut out a lot of the dead weight, whether that's, you know, Netflix or I don't know, cleaning your apartment for the third time in the week, cause you don't want to, <laughs> do a bunch of cold calls or something, you actually get a lot more time. I think what's also interesting for entrepreneurs is that there's a lot of studies that show if you have variety in your life, it's almost as if your life is longer. Hmm. And so um, one of the cool things is that if you're doing a little bit of sales, a little bit of marketing, a little bit of this and that, you know, you're, you actually, it's almost as if you're experiencing more of life because we've all had those moments where you forgot your, where you put your keys because you've done that 6,000 times. And so your brain just like deletes that. Right. Um, but if you're, if you're doing something different every day, um, it's a lot more enjoyable. Hmm. Interesting. Even if it's work. Yeah, for sure. Even if it's work, especially if it's work you enjoy, I think, and I think that most people, you know, who are entrepreneurs enjoy the work. They enjoy the grind, just like, yeah. Will be Brian enjoy it, you know, pushing himself to the limit and breathing hard and, you know, doing all this stuff that a lot of people would say, wow, that sounds like torture. Netflix is gone. Sure. If, if, if that's okay. a, a good thing that serves you. Yeah. So tell me about this, this cleaning out this, this detox, getting rid of the dead weight. You said get, getting rid of the, you know, the, the, the baggage. 
think about the stuff that you spend your day on could be meetings that don't need to happen, especially as entrepreneurs. I think most people, before they get to the point of product market fit, procrastinate a ton because it's, it feels good to have a meeting with your co-founder about the strategy of your business versus calling a hundred potential customers and having the fear that somebody's going to say no to you. And so you, we do all these things that delay our progress and impede really where we want to go. And so if you can be a little bit more aware about that stuff, you can free up a ton of your time. Like uh, I I was reading the book by Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people. Yeah, and famous, famous book. Yeah. yeah. It's about a hundred years old, but it's still very true. Um, really good advice. And one of the anecdotes in the book is somebody who on Saturdays looks, spends an hour looking back at their calendar for the week and thinking about what are the meetings I could have deleted from this? What did I learn? Yeah. And how do I sort of optimize my time going forward? And I think that if you do that, um, and you don't have to do it every week, just do it today for the last three weeks. And you'll probably find you can save 20% of your, your day pretty easily. Oh, it's interesting. You bring that up. Cause I had a talk with a friend earlier, voice notes, which is also saving time, voice notes, <laughs> more people need to do it. He, he's kind of a new entrepreneur. He just started a business. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm kind of busy. And one of the things I'm having trouble with is getting to the gym. I'm like, dude, you got a house. Like, you're supposed to work out at home. (laughs) Yeah. If you want to be an entrepreneur, that's how you save time. Right. You work out at home. What are you going to go to the gym for? Yeah, I completely agree. I used to do what I call the entrepreneur's workout, which is I had a pull-up bar and two weights. And I would work out for 15 or 20 minutes in just like really intense circuits. And I was in, you know, one of the best shapes of my life just doing that. And it it was 20 minutes before I took a shower in the morning before I I went to work, you know, versus going to the gym, you gotta, you go there, you get changed, you warm up. Like that's, that can be an hour and a half, two hours. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't need that much exercise really. I mean, it's another topic for another day, but. You know, you know, many people would say walking is the best exercise there is, you know? Yeah, for sure. I go for a 20 minute walk two, three times a day and, you know, breaks from the office, you know, <laughs> why not? Some push ups just to complement the rest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. And you can even do a call while you're taking a walk. Yeah, you got it. Or voice notes. <laughs> yeah. I'm you're all about talking. voice notes. <laughs> You know, time is a thing for an entrepreneur or, or, or for a nonprofit entrepreneur, someone who's looking to achieve in an office type setting. They're, they're, in, that, they're in that grind. And I once heard Gary V, I'm sure you know who he is. I once heard him say, all his meetings are five minutes. Like if, it, if it's going to be more than five minutes, I don't want it. Mm. Like what a time saver, huh? Yeah. And unfortunately, so I I used to work as a venture capitalist and I spoke to maybe 1500 entrepreneurs and almost without fail, the best companies, the pitch meeting was less than 30 minutes. And the worst companies were always long. They're always an hour. And it's because Entrepreneurs who aren't articulate, who can't synthesize ideas, they're not going to be good at hiring. They're not going to be good at getting customers. They're, they honestly probably aren't even very good at strategy. And so I, I think that's right. The five-minute meeting, um, yeah, that, that sounds about right. It's kind of aligned with like the whole Bezos like memo meeting thing, right? Where here's a document, you can probably read it in 10 minutes, um, that is all of the information that otherwise would have been discussed over the course of an hour with a lot of, you know, how's it going and all that other jazz. And again, this is why I like the voice note. <laughs> you talk to three, four, five people at one time, you know, 
one minute here, two minutes there. You, you mentioned the book you're, you're reading. You mentioned Bezos. What are some of your top books for becoming a successful entrepreneur? That's, yeah, that's an interesting question. I always love the snowball about Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. And you might not think of Warren Buffett as an entrepreneur, but he has an extremely entrepreneurial brain. And he's a guy that he learned how to do something really well, which was value investing and this whole like cigar butt investing, right? Like you find a cigar butt that somebody discarded at the end of the road, you take the last two puffs for free. And then he kind of reinvented himself and he figured out how to one, create like a, an interesting vehicle to do this through Berkshire Hathaway and sort of perpetual capital. There's a lot of tax advantages and then also investing into really great businesses at good prices. And so they're an investor in Snowflake, which is a publicly traded company that trades for about 80 times forward revenue. It's like a billion dollar in forward revenue and it trades at like $75 billion market cap. That's not exactly a cigar butt business. And so Buffett, even when he was a little kid, like figured out all these like hacks and ways of like creating wealth for himself that I think was really interesting and really entrepreneurial. I think another sort of non-obvious book is The Fountainhead by Ann Rand. I think a lot of entrepreneurs talk about like Atlas Shrugged. The Fountainhead's an interesting book where the main character is a sort of like extremely independent minded person who, you know, bucks society and blah, 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 like six of their guns throughout this huge trough and eventually is successful. Uh, and then I think there's like some of the more obvious ones, like the hard thing about hard things by uh, Ben Horowitz is an amazing book. The everything store, the book about Elon Musk, like shoe dog, you know, all those like really great, books about the best entrepreneurs out there. And then there's a lot of good tactical books about, you know, founding sales, um, revenue operations, remote work, et cetera. Business is like a sport. And <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, I mean, you can really, you can really sharpen your sword in, in, in different areas. Yeah, you sure can. And I don't think it's like, a coincidence that, you know, some of these things that like dominate a lot of our lives, like sports or capitalism, that <laughs> they, they share a lot of the same traits because they're pretty aligned with human nature, you know? And if we were different, then we would have different systems that sort of sparked our interests and allowed us to create stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of, I mean, the, the cool thing about today's day and age is like, you can just learn so much from books, the internet, communities, podcasts, clubhouse. You can even reach out to some of these people. You can't reach out to Oprah, but you can reach out to like the people below her, you know, maybe two tiers below her and, and talk to them if you have the right message that appeals to, you know, their ego and, and, yeah. and their motivations. Mm. Well, you just mentioned something interesting. Ego. Yeah. Now that's sales 101, right? It you wanna massage that ego, get to someone's ego so that you can persuade? I think it's people 101. Like it it doesn't matter if it's your friend or your prospect. Yeah. We're all sort of persuading. You, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, I that's mean, look, the that's, that's the first four chapters in how to win friends and influence people is like your people's egos and it doesn't matter. Yeah. What, what, what the person is, it's just people are people. And so you can't, you know, come out and criticize people. Um, you, you know, what, what's like the, the person's favorite word, it's their name. What's the most. <laughs> spoken word they analyze like i don't know 5000 phone calls what's the most spoken word it's i who's everybody's best friend it's your the dog that wags its tail and smiles at you and and loves you no matter what and there's some interesting books out there like the challenger model in sales that 
says the most successful people will challenge prospects and will get them to think of the world in a new way, but they're not doing it in an attacking way. They're doing it in a way that says, Hey, you're really good at your job. I really like you, et cetera, but let me, let me help you as well. Yeah. Um, let me kind of frame this in a way that is very palatable to you. Not, Hey, here's what you're doing wrong. Um, and I, I think, yeah, I think it's, uh, really important and it's important for managing people, for hiring partnerships, friendships, basically everything. I once heard the, the wolf of wall street, I'm forgetting his name, Jordan, something. Jordan Belfort. Yeah. Jordan, I once heard him say that, you know, sales is everywhere. Like you said, I mean, you even have to persuade your kid to go to sleep on time, you know, yeah. or to eat their vegetables. So everything's persuasion in some way, some way. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's, it's interesting because like, he's definitely a, a salesperson and that's like the framework that he sees his life. Just like some people see it as poker or basketball or, you know, whatever your sort of like framework is that, that you love. Um, but I, I think he's totally right. And sometimes you got to sell yourself, right? Like this whole procrastination thing it's essentially, you know, trying to like warm up your ego and convince yourself that you can actually go out and do X, Y, Z. And that aligns with your incentives versus spending your time doing this other thing that is just going to maybe in the short term, save your ego, but in the long term, hurt your pocketbook. Mm -hmm. So do you like doing cold calls? I don't think any, well, I know some people say they like doing cold calls. I, I, I don't know if people actually like doing cold calls. I do not personally. No, no. <laughs> there's a lot of rejection involved, right? Yeah. I think you got to be in the right mindset. You got to have kind of have your armor on and you have to convince yourself that what you're doing is the correct thing from a, you know, a moral and also pragmatic viewpoint. So that when you inevitably reach that rejection, you can laugh it off and go on to the next one. Mm. And there are some people that can do that. There are some people that can't. You probably don't know actually until you try and you have to do it. Yeah. Well, ultimately, it hurts more getting rejected from someone you care about versus a stranger, right? Yeah. It's funny. I always tell entrepreneurs, don't look at your unsubscribes on your email list because, right. you know, the, we're the first people to sign up for your email list. It's like your friends, your family. And then after like a couple months, they're like, why the heck am I getting this thing that's totally irrelevant to my life? And so they start unsubscribing. Um, and it's, it's pretty easy to take that personally. Um, yeah. But it's just, you know, my, my friends don't need a newsletter about HR software. So I, I don't really take it too personally. Earlier, you talked about calling a co-founder and kind of spitballing ideas. That's always been my favorite thing is the creation process of something and getting yeah. together with another human or two or three and just, you know, maybe getting in front of a whiteboard and just, you yeah. know, you're, you're making something from, from, from nothing to something. Do you enjoy that process? I think everybody enjoys it. It releases a lot of dopamine. Uh because your brain's rewarding you for thinking and making progress, but it's sort of like, it's not real because at the end of the day, you have to like do that for an hour and then execute for a hundred hours. I think a lot of entrepreneurs, right. they like, I, I just talked to a friend of mine from high school actor from kindergarten who's starting a business. Um, and Every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from eight to nine o'clock, him and his co-founder talk because they both have jobs and they basically do that. You know, they strategize, they talk about their grand plans for the future, et cetera. And it's been six months. They haven't made any progress <laughs> right, like, right. at all. And they, they love it. You know, it's like, a, it's an amazing hobby. And my guess is they probably will never actually start a business, <laughs> but and I love it too. Like, I love doing that stuff. Like, that's probably one of my favorite things to do in the whole world. But I yeah. also recognize that I love it. And I don't necessarily love it because it's like making progress. I love it for the sake of it. And therefore, 
you have to be careful um, about getting sucked into just doing that and never making progress. Well, you're, you're, you're putting me on right now. Cause I, it never dawned on me. It never dawned on me, the dopamine and the feeling good. Now, I've had some, I spent a lot of time brainstorming in the, the last 20 years, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, you know, some things never come to light or they're sitting on my computer right now. Maybe they'll come back around or something, but it, 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 it never dawned on me, the chemical reaction. You're, you're right. And that can create, uh, I, I don't know, addiction might be a, a, a harsh word, but it creates a, a fondness of doing it. Like you said, like a hobby. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think if you hang out at parties in New York City and you talk to the people that work in finance who hate their jobs, all of them have some sort of business they're starting on the side and it's been going on for years. They might have even spent a lot of money on it, lawyers or a development shop or something. But the the number one thing they love to do is ideate, pontificate, whiteboard, you know, put together spreadsheets, et cetera. And at the end of the day, it's not useful. It's it's just like a fun activity for them. They they just don't realize that, but that's what it is. And it's an escape, just like watching a movie or reading a book or, you know, whatever. Yeah, you're kind of feeding the ego. Yeah, you're, you're... yeah. <laughs> you're thinking like, when I'm when I'm Mark Zuckerberg, you know. Yeah. Uh, this is the house I'm going to buy. This is the VC I'm going to raise from. You know, all, all these smart things that I'm weaving into this more and more complicated idea that then I can't even articulate, and that gets back to that previous point where, you know, the the best pitches by entrepreneurs they're 30 minutes or less. And in the first 90 seconds, you know exactly what the business does and everything else is just diligence, right? It's who are the customers? How many? Talk about your on quota sales reps. You know, what's the sales cycle? What's your average ACV, et cetera. That first 90 seconds that explains what the business does for one of these guys at a party, one of these guys who just pontificates or whiteboards, that's an hour. And at the end of the hour, you're like, what does this thing do? It's like 19 different ideas woven together. And it's just this person's like, you know, basically art project in their brain. So what's your advice on that? Just, you're saying just 30 minutes, a 30 minute brainstorm, get it on paper and then let's execute. Um, It depends on how complicated the project is, but yeah, I think there, there are a few things that take longer than that. And then it's about creating goals that will get you closer to whether or not this is actually going to work. So if you're starting a business like incorporation, creating a website, like those sorts of things, like don't get at the core things that are going to make or break your business. Like everybody can incorporate a business. Everybody can, you know, pay a lawyer to like have your friend sign an NDA for no reason. If you tell them about your business idea, Mm. Um, what's going to make or break is like, Do you have a new distribution channel that like you need to test? Do you have a new value prop that you need to test? Do you have a different way of manufacturing something you need to test? Those are the things you need to make progress on. And so, yeah, and it should be like a one to 100 ratio of brainstorming to execution. Yeah, you got to make like action steps, right? And then just yeah, plow through them. Yeah, exactly. And say, hey, if, if we're not hitting X by Y date, then we're out. You know, we're going to move on to the next thing. It's so savage. Because <laughs> some people, well, you know, I'm more of a creator. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking books. We're talking music. We're talking, you know, artist type stuff. Yeah. To just ditch one of your things is like, it's savage. It's, it's like, you know, it's like a bird kicking out one of its babies because it's a runt. Like, ah, uh, we're done with you. <laughs> okay. Out of the nest. I think art is something that truly has a creative, like a very creative process is different. And a lot of business has creative processes as well, right? Maybe it's 10% versus 90% for like an actual piece of artwork or fiction. But 
I think even as an artist, like you kind of have to say, Hey, I'm not making progress on this thing and it's not giving me joy. And therefore I need to move on to the next thing. And and maybe I come back to it in three months, Mm. but um, it's, it's not working for me right now. Just like an entrepreneur says, Hey, you know, this distribution channel isn't working for me right now for whatever reason. I can revisit it with a new brain in three months, but I'm just going to be banging my head against the wall. So what's the point? Yeah. I had some downtime about six weeks ago. And I, I, I wrote a book in 10 days. Wow. Small book, booklet. I think the days of, uh, you know, these big, thick ones are pretty much done unless it's a novel. People, people want that 150 page zinger. But anyway, my point is it's sitting on my computer, just sitting there, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know. Have you thought to yourself why that is? Well, I- I'm going to use it. I'm going to publish it uh, when the time is right. Um, what does that mean? Getting the ducks in a row. Um, it's, it's on food addiction. Okay. And nutrition. So um, I'm re- sort of rebranding my nutrition stuff. So I'm waiting for some things to be in a row. And then, you know, everything's got to be just so perfect, you know, perfectionist. Yeah. I, the only thing I would say is uh, probably one of the most powerful things I've learned through like meditation and entrepreneurship is many times having that sort of mentality is actually the result of fear Mm -hmm. and waiting for everything to be perfect is you actually saying, geez, I'm afraid this thing's not going to sell or I'm afraid that this critic's going to hate it or I'm, I'm afraid of X, Y, and Z. And so we procrastinate, like that's what procrastination is. It's, it's a reaction to fear. Fear. Yeah. Um, And so you, and yeah. I'm not criticizing you and I, and I apologize because yeah. I'm, no, no, I'm that's all right. you know, violating like the whole, you know, win friends framework here. But, um, I think for me, what I've found is like many times when I'm like, I'm waiting for this thing before I publish this thing or whatever. Yeah. And usually when I think about it, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm just like afraid of what people are going to say about this. And that's why I'm not doing it. Or I'm afraid yeah. our customers are going to say, screw you or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, which I think is, with entrepreneurship, like it's hard to put yourself out there. We all have imposter syndrome. And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah. Especially in the social media era, because we're jumping out there. We're putting ourselves on the line, like our, sure. our, our beliefs, our art, our opinions, whatever it is. Yeah. And there's a lot of haters and there's also a lot of trollers, trollers. There's trollers and there's a lot of people that, you think are, you know, doing perfectly and, and, and they're not right. And so you're, you're like, gee whiz, like, I don't have all this stuff that this other person has, but in reality, like we're all basically the same. So you you probably do. Um, and you just gotta push yourself off the cliff, so to speak. Yeah. Making stuff is the, the easy part for me and the fun part. Yeah. Marketing is the, uh, it's know. tough. Cause then you're, you're basically, you're facing a lot of personal rejection, right? Because yeah. somebody doesn't want your thing that you created. That's a part of you. Yeah. And you're that hurts a lot. Um, and also it's, it's sort of like, why am I having to beg somebody to, to consume this thing that I put so much time into? Sure. Um, that doesn't make me feel good. Right. Yeah. I remember taking marketing classes and learning about funnels and all that. Yeah. And webinars and copy and the email sequences. Yeah. And I remember being disgusted. <laughs> really? That's yeah. funny. I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is so persuasive and, you know, just from an artist perspective, I just want to make the stuff, you know, <laughs> where's the other person to come along and do that? You know, 
like yeah. like the two Steves that did Apple. Steve Jobs was, yeah. you know, more of the talker, the, the the marketer, and the other Steve was the guy who, you know, was technologically sound and put the stuff together. You know. Yeah, but aren't we also grateful for Steve Jobs? You know what I mean? Like it, it actually he was the main catalyst. Like there's probably hundreds of Steve Wozniaks who built cool stuff in their basements that we never knew about and never impacted people's lives. Just like there's, a, I mean, there are people I know very well who are artists who nobody knows about them. Nobody probably ever will because they don't have any sizzle. Like you need a little bit of sizzle. You can't just be all steak. Um, but they're so you, talented, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think there's anybody probably in the world who's like just an amazing artist. Um, like Banksy, like, isn't an amazing artist. Like they're a phenomenal marketer as well. Um, I don't, I don't know if, can you think of any creator that's just an amazing artist that isn't a good marketer that people know about? Hmm. Yeah, I suppose. I would have to really rack my brain, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I get what you're saying. So I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And in fact, I think if you have something that's going to help people, it's, it's actually amazing to be an evangelist for that product. Set up a little funnel. Set up the funnel, set up the webinars. Get it cracking. Yeah. Facebook ads, Instagram ads, drive the traffic. Sure. Split test. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> You know? and then, yeah, and then somebody sitting behind the computer looking at the stats, just like a sport. Yeah, basically, exactly. Except there's dollar signs attached to it. Yeah. So, how do we not be so attached to the results? That's a really hard question, and something that I've uh, struggled with as an entrepreneur, cause I'm very numbers and data driven mm -hmm. and I love to understand the data because that helps me better do other stuff. Um, what I've done is I've sort of set guardrails around things that are already working. So let's say you have a Facebook campaign that you know is ROI positive. Don't check it every day. Don't check your Google analytics every day. And by not looking at those numbers all the time and focusing more on process or setting longer term objectives, then you can stop being so outcomes oriented. Mm. The base camp guys, I think have talked a lot about this. Uh, the Wistia guys have talked a lot about this. And I mean, the Wistia guys are film students, right? They're, they're just like film nerds that started this software business and they kind of like go into work and like have fun. And I remember Chris Savage, the CEO was asked in an interview, like, what's your revenue? He's like, I don't even know. Um, which I think is interesting because it's a, it's a pretty big company and they have a lot of, you know, debt and sh shareholders and, and, you know, internal shareholders. So it's kind of funny that he doesn't even know the revenue numbers. That's kind of crazy. And it's not because he's a dumb guy. It's because he's just like really process oriented and in enjoying building the business. So um, I think it's really tough, but you, you it's kind of like you, what is that whole like data thing? Like you change what you measure or whatever. And so like, if you stop staring at your numbers, like you'll, you won't measure those. You'll measure the other stuff, which is the process. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. He didn't even know what his numbers were. Yeah. He's like, I know it's a lot, but I don't know exactly what it is. Yeah. I do that a lot with just regular life stuff, you know, just dropping the details purposely, just yeah. whatever. Or it's in my notes. I'll know it if I go to my notes, but I'm not keeping it here in the brain for what? So. Yeah. It's interesting. It is interesting. And you got to kind of know your audience and stuff like that. But I think, uh, it, it's a powerful way of thinking for sure. 
when you went to Harvard Business School for your MBA, did you, uh, was it overly stressful? Was it overly stressful time? Um, not really, to be quite honest with you. I think that that program used to be a real meat grinder and they've since changed it to make it probably a lot more fulfilling in the ways that matter. And so, for example, like the grading system, you either get a one, two, or three in the class. Top 10% get a one, middle 80 get two, bottom 10% get a three. Hmm. You're probably not going to get a three. Um, unless like you really screw up the exam or like, you know, you really don't participate or whatever. Like there's always going to be like 10% of people who like just don't do a good job. Right. And so you, you kind of stress a lot less about your academic performance, especially because like, there's not a lot of transparency to the outside world in terms of how you're doing. You're not on the 4.0 GPA scale, um, where everybody kind of knows what a three, seven means or what a two, seven means. And so that decreases the stress a lot and allows you to focus more on learning, if that makes sense, than just like schoolwork. It also allows you to focus on stuff like, hey, you know, Ray Dalio is speaking on campus or, you know, Seth Harmon is doing a lunch with like whoever wants to sign up or, you know, whatever the case may be. And like do all this other stuff that you can learn a ton about, as well as just learn from your classmates. Like you're in the room with like former Navy SEALs, people that have sold their own companies, people that are from Uganda and Singapore and like, you know, all, all walks of life. And so, um, yeah, I think they do a pretty decent job actually of decreasing stress and making it a, a really amazing experience. So tell me about your business now. What are you doing? So I run a website called Select Software Reviews and essentially what we do is try to help HR and recruiting teams to find and buy the right software through in-depth content that is free on our website. We don't do any consulting. We just essentially run like a really big blog that's similar to Nerd Wallet or the wire cutter, except focus on HR technology, everything from payroll and applicant tracking systems through artificial applications for, you know, diversity hiring and, and very like niche things. So, um, yeah, we get about 40,000 companies a month that use our website wow. and are building a, a really cool community, global community of HR practitioners who just want to figure out how to best leverage technology and their people operations. Cool. Before I hit you with my last question, where can someone come find you? Say hello, reach out, see your work. Sure. So I've, I've got a website that I update infrequently philstrizula.com um linkedin is a good place to find me as well in the entrepreneurial kingdom what's the deal with sleep because you hear stories of some people thriving on four hours and then other people would be like no i need my eight or nine but i think about vince mcmahon all right billionaire ww he's it's, he's famous for four hours and he, and he doesn't sneeze. He doesn't let himself sneeze. Just a weird thing, but he thrives on four hours. He's 75 years old. So it's obviously wor- like he's not in super bad health or anything. So what's the deal with sleep in entrepreneurs? So there's about 1% of the population that needs less than five hours of sleep. Um, mm-hmm. I have a friend like that and you know, he can stay out till 2 a.m. He gets up at six. He's fresh as a daisy. He's like a, just a high capacity person. I don't think we've figured out at this point what's different about those people and how other people could, could do the same. But almost everybody else needs eight and a half to nine hours of sleep. And if you don't have that, then you lower your IQ drastically. And you could do it a test of this with yourself. It's really easy to do. Just literally skip, you know, an hour of sleep tonight and take a test that you took today um, and see how you do. There's lots of data that supports that, right? There's like more heart attacks on daylight savings time, more car crashes. um, And that's just an hour. So I think everybody needs sleep. 
I get eight and a half to nine hours of sleep a night. You see on Twitter now, a lot of people, they love the uh, eight sleep uh, system. A lot of entrepreneurs have bought into that. I actually have one as well. And um, yeah, I think that if you're not getting enough sleep, you are essentially drunk at work and you're not going to be at a high capacity. And that's why like your buddy who, you know, doesn't have time to go to the gym. I agree. Work out from home, but definitely work out because you want your brain running at hundred percent capacity to do something hard, like start a business. You don't want it running at 85% capacity because it's almost like a logarithmic scale where the impact of that is like a, a five X, you know, like your brain at 85% is one fifth as effective as it at a hundred percent and that in terms of the outcomes that you should expect. So, um, yeah, everybody needs sleep. And unless you're one of these Vince McMahon type, uh, freaks that is in the 1%. A lot of like Indian gurus and whatnot, yogis and stuff. They, they only do four hours as well. Bump. Something energetic there, something, I don't know. But, but I tend to agree eight hours is, is a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And if you think about meditation, like it's almost like a sleep like state where your, your brain sort of like deleting stuff you don't need and create memories and blah, blah, blah. And so it's not, it wouldn't be crazy to think that like they're getting a lot of benefits of sleep through meditation and are able to therefore sleep less. Sure. If, if I have trouble sleeping, I will, I'll meditate. It's, it's a form of rest. You yeah. know, it's, it's not all the way sleep, but you know, it is rest. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I have to look up this eight sleep system. Cause I'm curious now. It's uh yeah, it's essentially a bed that you can have like different cooling zones. I mean, it's, it's really designed for like, if your partner that you share a bed with has a very different temperature than you do. Yeah. Um, you can make the bed like 55 degrees or like 115 degrees and you could have one side be 115 and one side be 55. It does a lot of other stuff like measures like your HRV and stuff like that. I don't know how impactful that is, but, um, the, the cooling alone is very, very good. So you have it. Yeah. <laughs> you put the investment in. Yeah, it's worth it. I mean, it's, it's not cheap. It's, I think it's 2000 bucks, but if you spread that over, uh, you know, eight hours times five years or whatever, however long you're going to use it, it's like whatever, a, a buck a night, um, to have much better sleep. Like, yeah, that's worth it. hundred percent. How much do you spend on coffee? Yeah. I mean, it has been known that when it's cool in the room, you, you tend to sleep better. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. Cool. Phil, it's been a pleasure talking to you today, man. Yeah, this is a fun conversation. Thanks for the interesting questions. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese. If this episode opened your heart, feel free to share on social media and tell your loved ones. Also, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next time, may peace be with you.